I started this morning, those of you who are here this morning, with this image. It's combining two uh, contemporary icons, one of uh, Dame Julian Norwich. And this is um, the, the vision that she had of the earth contained uh, in a small compass. She compared it to a hazelnut. She was in a deep contemplative prayerful state when she saw this. And she saw the earth as very fragile in that state. But she saw, she was assured by God that God loved it and that it would uh, endure because of God's love. So she is, uh, as you know, the real image, a real model of the, the pure contemplative. She's, she spent her, her adult life, much of her adult life, in a hermitage attached to the side of Norwich Cathedral. I mean, there she was. And, and there was a cat. Um, <laughs> you see that in some icons of her. And there was a way to speak to people who came for spiritual counsel on the street. And there was a connection inside to the cathedral. But that is where she lived, in that rooted uh, place of contemplation. And on, the, um, on my left is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, in the Birmingham jail. So when I was Bishop Suffragan of Alabama, my office was uh, in view of both the 16th Street Baptist Church and of the Birmingham jail. And um, he wrote that one of the great pieces of writing in English of the 20th century, in my view, that letter, he wrote it to one of my predecessors. Um, and five other clergy in uh, Birmingham. So the bishop of, the real bishop, the diocesan bishop, not the suffragan, of uh, Alabama, Bishop Carpenter, was one of the people who received this letter. And it, he wrote it to them because they said, Bishop Carpenter said and the others, yes, integration, but not yet. So a kind of idea of gradualism and waiting. And he said, you know, we cannot wait. And that, all that flow. So he would be, you know, pretty much the picture of activism. We don't consider him the contemplative. Together, they are this unity of action and contemplation uh, together. And I want to suggest that that actually is an answer, that it, it works. Uh, that is, Francis and Claire is another great example, contemporaries and friends. Uh, so Definitely, uh, Francis was a contemplative, but we think of a great deal of his action in the world, um, peacemaking um, at all levels, peacemaking at all levels. But, and Claire, uh, the contemplative. But they make together a wholeness. But I also want to suggest that that wholeness can be found in an individual human life, that we can find this, this wholeness within ourselves, that the wells of contemplation can lead to action for justice in an individual human life, life, as well as in, you see, this is a seed of a community, the idea of a community together. So this spring, um, this past spring, I became inspired to do a little research on uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, uh, the great, maybe, I'm going to make people mad, um, maybe the greatest living Buddhist t uh, teacher. OK, everybody, <laughs> hold off. Uh, it, you know, he's, well, he's a phenomenal uh, teacher uh, of Buddhism. And uh, also his relationship with Martin Luther King, Jr. As you know, Martin Luther King, Jr. nominated uh, Thich Nhat Hanh for the 1967 Nobel Peace Prize. And he wrote an extraordinary letter nominating him publicly. And that may be one reason there was no Peace Prize given that year, because the Nobel Committee wants those to be in private. Uh, Dr. King deliberately made it a public statement, uh, wanting to force the hand of the committee, and they were not going to be forced. But the point was made. The point was made. So I, w I became interested in this because um, these anniversaries, the 50th of the Selma March, the these are not accidents. I want to suggest to you that these moments come to us as anniversaries because we need them. There's a message for us when these anniversaries come around. Because isn't it true that a lot of things happened 50 years ago? A lot of big things happened 50 years ago. So why those? You know, why are those the ones that 
prick our consciousness and make us pay attention and make us think because I think we need them. There's a message in them that we need. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So uh, Thich Nhat Hanh was also uh, a friend, and uh, Merton was an advocate for him uh, because this was in the heart of the Vietnam War. And Thich Nhat Hanh started the Buddhist peace movement. Oh. And he w took no sides, but only the side of humanity, the side of the earth, the side of peace. So he was an enemy to North Vietnam. He was an enemy to South Vietnam. He has never lived permanently back in, in Vietnam as a result. And um, Thomas Merton became one of his advocates, helping the United States to understand and accept this advocate for peace from Vietnam. And look at that. Such a beautiful picture of Martin Luther King with Thich Nhat Hanh. They're both so young. And uh, in Dr. King's Nobel Peace Prize nomination letter, he mentions that the young Buddhist scholar and meditator had already written 12 books. So I became interested in this moment, this anniversary kind of moment, to ask, what were they? Uh, so I looked you know, a lot of places to find what were those 12 books. They're not easy to find. Uh, I never found the whole list of those early publications of his. But in the San Francisco Public Library, public libraries are you know, Aladdin's cave uh, to me. They're amazing, amazing places. And in the San Francisco Public Library, the main library over there near City Hall, I found five original copy books of his from before 1967. Really amazing. And I want to show you what I found in one of his books. This is the inside cover of Lotus in a Sea of Fire. Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire. That's Vietnamese language script. Someone wrote all over the pages, including on, you can see, onto the uh, dust cover. And twice in that area it says CIA. That's the only part I can read. So they had an opinion. They had an opinion about this war from a Vietnamese, some Vietnamese perspective that they wanted to share. And this is in the text itself. Uh, it says, it's, it's a little section where Thich Nhat Hanh is writing about the National Liberation Front. And you can see somebody has marked it out four times and then written above it, NLF is a political puppet of North Vietnam, a different opinion. Uh, so the reason I'm showing you these things, well, they're fantastic, right? <laughs> I'm showing you these things because they show the passion uh, that he had for peace. So this is a man that most people know today as having written Peace is Every Step, Ways to Deal with Anger. Um, he's a person of contemplation today in his 89th year. Uh, he, he is a person we have made into one side of those icons of contemplation and action. But in fact, he was a passionate person engaged in social justice, along with Martin Luther King Jr. and Thomas Merton. They're all working in both spheres of contemplation and action. And what is it that allowed them to do this? Well, what the topic was that I was interested in in looking at all this was that in 1967, Dr. King not only nominated Thich Nhat Hanh for the Peace Prize, he started quoting the idea of interrelationship and interconnectedness all over the place. In fact, one place he said, the basic thing I want to say to you is that all of life is interconnected. That's the basic thing. I want you to know that. That's really the first time it starts to appear in his work, this idea of interconnectedness. I do not want to suggest that he got that from Thich Nhat Hanh. That is a Buddhist principle. I don't think that's how it happened. I looked and looked at this. I think it's what another Buddhist principle would describe as co-arising, that, that it arose together out of their common commitment to justice and to the contemplative life. And what was that seed 
that allowed them both to talk about the interconnection. I think it was first that they made peace with the being who is within through silence and through deep inner work. And then they made the same peace with the other. Inner relationships, all of life interconnected, meaning all of life can be loved, respecting its differences, not erasing its differences, but respecting its differences. So, so I think that's what, what it is. Um, Thank you for those steps on, uh, here are Martin Luther King's own steps on nonviolence. Here's how he said we should plan a nonviolent action. Collection of the facts, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. And here's where uh, this relationship comes. Uh, this is also Dr. King. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. And I will close by reading uh, a 1967 poem of Thich Nhat Hanh's, which is all about this deep interconnectedness at a very personal level. This is called, Let Me Give Back to Our Motherland. <laughs> Last night, four of my brothers died. One was Tho, one was Tuan, one was He, one was Lan. Let this be known to you. Brothers, sisters, my people, my motherland. Four young workers, young men, heard my appeal, went out to the hamlets, worked two years, sowing trust and love that peace might reappear. Their flesh is mine. Their blood is mine. My flesh is crushed. My blood is dried. At midnight they were dragged barefoot, bareheaded to the riverside, pushed to their knees and shot, and I was shot down on the riverbank. In your presence, O oh compatriots, O oh brothers and sisters, let me return the flesh of my brothers to our motherland. Let me return the blood of my brothers to our motherland. The ch this chaste blood and pure flesh, flesh which never soiled our name and their hands. Let me return these to humanity because their hands did not destroy, because their hearts bore no hatred. As for the skin of their bodies, let me give this back to you, O oh compatriots, the skin of four who never cooked an animal's flesh in its own skin. Use, please, the skin of my brothers to mend those open wounds in our people's flesh, that immense body which swoons in agony. <laughs>